Hey there. Uh, so my name is Christiane. Um, I was I gave a talk actually last night um, to a grad student union at my undergraduate institute uh, in Toronto, and um, unfortunately the recording didn't. Uh, it actually wasn't recorded. Um, so I decided to make my own video. Um, I only have actually three minutes to make this video uh, before it cuts me off. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk about briefly, um, which what I talked about last night is how do I become a medical physicist? And if you've been following me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or even Instagram, um, I've been sharing updates of actually what I do. Um, during the day. So uh, this is a picture of me at Mass General just checking the resolution of a spec uh, system. And I also do work at Boston Children's Hospital where I, I did a, a CT and ACR check um, on this, uh, also this a spec CT system. And I go to conferences like the Radiological Society of North America and also the American Association of, uh, of Physicists and Medicine, otherwise known as the APM. Um, there's also a Canadian equivalent to that, which is the Canadian Organization of Medical Physicists. Um, so basically what I talked about is how do I become a medical physicist? And there are different ways to do that. So first off, um, I mean, I got my undergraduate degree um, at Ryerson and I did my degree in physics. Um, physics or engineering is probably preferred um, because when you go into uh, to do a master's or a PhD, you'll be doing some sort of, you'll be doing a medical physics project. So it requires some knowledge in physics. Um, so after you do an undergraduate degree, you can go into a master's program. Um, now it's preferred, I mean, if, the, if, if you go into a master's program and it's CAMPIP accredited, then um, what you can do is basically, um, you, can, you can actually still apply uh, for a residency but your chances of getting a residency would be greater with a PhD. So if you're offered a PhD, um, um, I would take it. So, uh, and make sure that the PhD is actually CAMPIP accredited. Because if you do the CAMPIP accreditation, then you can apply uh, for a residency. Now you can apply to either therapy or imaging, and then you can make your selection then. Um, I came from an imaging background. I went into an imaging residency. I've, I know people who've gone from imaging to therapy. I don't know anyone who's gone from therapy to imaging, but I, I mean, I think that's still a possibility. Now, if you happen to do a master's degree in like engineering and it wasn't CAMPEP accredited, you can, um, you can do a certified program um, over here. Uh, so <clears throat> this is if you didn't do a CAMPEP accredited uh, degree. So you basically just do the CAMPEP accredited courses that are required uh, to apply for a residency. Now, so I went down the route of going from undergraduate degree uh, to PhD, and then I went um, from PhD to residency. Um, I also did a postdoc in between. So um, I did my, my undergraduate degree was at, um, at Ryerson in Toronto, and then I did my a PhD direct entry at Western University um, that was in London, Ontario. And then I did my postdoc at um, the University of, Ma of Wisconsin-Madison, um, obviously in Madison, and that was in medical physics. And then I went on to do a residency um, in, in the imaging tract. So you can choose either uh, imaging or, or therapy, as I mentioned. Um, we have, they have different tracks here. I can show you. So you have therapy over here and imaging. Um, so as I've shown, I do, I do tests, uh, different tests on, uh, on, on like CT, um, MRI, and I also do uh, nuclear medicine. So if you go into the imaging track, they, there are a lot of, there are a few programs now that offer both diagnostic um, and uh, both diagnostic and nuclear medicine, so you can be dual boarded. Um, so I'm definitely going for for that option. Um, so there were a few questions last night. Uh, so one of the questions was, if you were to start off as a graduate student today, would you do anything differently to get to your current position? Um, I think the one thing that I would do differently, um, when I was doing my PhD, I really felt like I was a little bit isolated and I, I probably isolated myself a little bit too much. I would, I would definitely do more networking. Uh, networking is the key to, um, to knowing like where you want to go and where you fit in. I mean, I was, now I do networking all the time. It, it's, it's, it's benefited me a whole lot. 
um, you know, people are really open to helping you. Um, I definitely like reaching out to people and telling them, you know, what what I've done to to get where I am today. Um, and uh, it also it's just good because sometimes you don't. Uh, it, it's it's a growing field, and so you you don't necessarily always know what's what's happening. And sometimes you need to hear things from other people um, so that you can be aware of of what's happening within the field. So. Um, networking is definitely something that I wish I had done a lot more of, but I do it now. Um, I do it all the time now. Um, another question was, what graduate study skills uh, have transferred over to your current position? Uh, definitely communication. I think that uh, communicating is probably the, the biggest asset you'll ever have uh, going forward in this career. Um, that's because you communicate with uh, other medical physicists and technologists, researchers, uh, radiologists. Um, I mean, it really is a, a fascinating career in the sense that you, you do get to work with people with, um, who have different backgrounds. And even you might uh, you might even be asked to give lectures, you know, to uh, people who don't necessarily have a, a medical physics background. Um, I know I'm giving a, a lecture um, in a few months um, uh, um, um, for uh, nuclear medicine uh, residents, uh, and the lecture is on radiobiology. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, doing that and saying yes to pretty much everything. So, you know, if, if my advisor wanted me to see something, I would say yes, like I definitely want to go see it. I mean, the, if, if there's any opportunity, um, even if it's not something that you're particularly interested in, I think just saying yes and going to observe it will uh, will make a difference um, because the more you know, the better the better off you are. Uh, which courses in your graduate curriculum would you find an asset to your current position? Um, I think anything that has to do with imaging. Um, I think learning how to code is extremely important. Um, at least learn MATLAB um, or Python, or I think both. I would I would definitely choose both, but um, you know, to do a PhD, I think you just need MATLAB because you have to know how to crunch numbers and make plots and all that. So just something that will help you analyze data um, is is probably good enough for your PhD. If you want to do something more um, more fancy, I would I would then go with Python. Um, but I would know both uh, going forward. And if you know how to code in other languages like C, C++, like uh, then that that's a really good thing. Um, I know how to code in C. Um, I don't use it as often right now, but um, it's something that I can definitely, you know, if, if someone asks me, like, do you know how to code in C? Would you be willing to help us with this? Like, yes, absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to, to help you with that. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. So that was kind of all the questions that I had. Um, if you have any other questions, if you have questions yourself, you can always just um, post them in the comment section. Uh, sorry, this video is in like three different parts, but, uh, you know, let me just see if I can pull up some of the statistics that I have. I have statistics here. I'm just going to, uh, here they are. Yeah. Um, so, I, oops. So I think that these statistics were a big hit uh, last night because, you know, people want to, it, it doesn't really help you going forward, but it might give you an idea of, um, of where the field is going. Um, may, give you an idea of what your chances are. Uh, so this is the summary statistics of 2018. So for CAMPEP, uh, there are 123 accredited residencies, 99 therapy, and 24 imaging. And uh, of those 24, 10 are with the nuclear medicine option. 108, uh, 108 in the United States and 14 in Canada, and one outside of, uh, Canada, uh, one outside of North America. Uh, which is in Ireland. Uh, there, for new residents, there was 153 in therapy and 21 in diagnostic. So, yeah, the the number of people who go into diagnostic is less, and there's also less positions, but that that just makes sense. 40% um, are with uh, have have a master's degree, 33% with PhD, and 27% um, with certificate. Um, so I think that having a PhD is super helpful, um, especially going forward in this career, just because, you know, I think that uh, if you want to be a leader in the field and if you want to come up with new ideas and publish them, I 
I highly suggest you get a PhD. Um, if you happen to get a PhD in another, you know, in a, doing something else like engineering or something, and then you decide to do a CAMPEP, then a CAMPEP, um, if you wanted to do the CAMPEP uh, certi certification, then you can do that. Just take a year and do that. 37% um, of these new residents are female and 63% are male. 77% uh, um, are from the US and 23% are international. Uh, the average slots per program is 1.55 for therapy and 1.14 for diagnostics. So yeah, there are very few slots. Like when I applied for this position, there was only one. Um, and so uh, it is highly competitive. Uh, for, residency graduate, for residency graduates, there were 140 therapy and 15 diagnostic. Uh, the total enrollment was 330 therapy and 54 diagnostic. So the average enrollment per program was uh, 3.4 therapy and 2.45 diagnostic. Um, so 69% were trained at a single site and 31% were at multiple sites. So I do a multiple site one. I work at five hospitals. Um, I think I prefer it that way uh, just so that I can compare how, you know, one institution does it over the other. Um, but, you know, um, some of the single, I mean, if you happen to be at a single site, it's not it's not a lost cause either. You can always go and observe um, what what people are doing at other sites if you're permitted to. Um, so this is the big one. So first employment post residency. So when did people find a job? Well, 81 uh, percent found a job before finishing, which is good. Ninety seven percent found a job uh, within three months, which is yeah, that's pretty good, too. And then 97% again within one year. So I think that's that's excellent. Um, sounds like it's it sounds like uh, that percentage didn't change though between three months and one year. But uh, so 42% uh, of the candidates were employed in a medical school or university. 29% uh, are in a private hospital, and 11% are within a med phys group. 10% uh, at a cancer center and 7% um, other, other, um, somewhere else and like 1% is looking. So uh, yeah, the board enrollment was for ABR, um, it was uh, 135, CCPM was eight, ABMP was one, and ABSNM was zero. So um, yeah, now for the Memphis match system. So when you, uh, that's the thing, uh, when you're applying for the residency, so when you're going from like any of these three um, categories to here, you have to go through a match system online and um, it's really easy. You just sign up for it and basically then you can kind of select which programs um, you would you would like to interview at um, and then they'll send you an email um, and you'll you'll be able to uh, interview for them. Um, so for the MedFiz, the, sorry, the MedFiz match uh, um, statistics. So we have 204 applicants uh, who submitted rankings uh, and 68 withdrew um, or did not submit rankings. Uh, the applicants that match submitted an average of 8.2 rankings. Uh, those did not, that did not match submitted an average of 11 rankings. So when I was ranking schools, um, I mean, I only, I only paid for 10 interviews and I had 10 interviews and I ended up ranking uh, I think I left one out. Yeah, I ranked nine. Um, so I had nine in my ranking. Uh, so I think having less sometimes is a good thing. I've seen people who have like 23 interviews and I wouldn't know how to rank 23. I, I like less, but you know, if you do less interviews then also your chances are less. So, um, you know, I happen to be lucky because when I interviewed here, I really felt like I should be here, which which is a good thing. Um, you all, you always want to end up somewhere where you're going to like it because, you know, you might ha you might have a, an opportunity as, uh, for a job after, and it's it's two years, and you want to enjoy it as well. Um, and I definitely I definitely enjoy downtown Boston. I will say that I, I was in Madison before, and I absolutely love Madison. But um, I think that if I wanted to do a multi-site place, I think Boston is definitely the way to go. Um, although, you know, if you end up in Madison also excellent place. So um, so 116 applicants matched and 88 
uh, did not. So of the 204 applicants that submitted rankings, 116 um, matched. So 65%. Uh, 92 programs registered. 92 programs registered for the match. Uh, the programs that filled all positions submitted an average of 8.6 rankings, and those with unfilled positions submitted an average of 4.8 rankings. Um, 116 positions filled, 13 unfilled. Um, that's 90%, the lowest percent in the last four years, and 81% uh, sorry, 81 programs with all positions filled, 11 with unfilled positions, so 88% lowest uh, percentage in the last four years. So um, if you're thinking about applying uh, to be a medical physicist, I highly encourage it. I think it's very rewarding work. If you can do research on top of it, that's all the better. Um, I think that to be honest, if you can skip the master's part and go straight to a PhD, that's that's better than than I, I don't want to say like doing a master's is a waste of time, but I think I would have I prefer to do a PhD and then a postdoc for two years rather than do a master's and then a PhD. Um, that's just my personal opinion, um, and it's okay to to when you're going for interviews to say that you're trying to decide between therapy and imaging. Um, I think I kind of understood, I, I understand that because from this, just from the statistics, uh, there are more jobs in the therapy than there are in the imaging. Um, although I, I do think that imaging um, is something that's a little bit more complicated and we don't see, um, we don't see any of the uh, you know, advance, advances in technology as we do on the therapy side where they have, you know, machine learning algorithms um, and stuff like that. And it's also really important to volunteer. So I, I volunteer with um, APM 3.0. Um, I just started working with them. Um, it's good to know how people do things at other institutions across the country. Um, this is all within the United States. Um, and, and actually, there is there are a few people that are from Canada as well. There's one girl from uh, uh, from Vancouver. So you know, there's a there's a wide variety, and um, you know, it's good to know just in general where the field is going, and and um, it's good to be involved in that way. So, anyways, uh, thank you for listening. Sorry, this video had to be kind of sliced up into different sections, but um, yeah, that was that was that was the. Uh, that was exactly what I talked about uh, last night. So um, I look forward to hearing your feedback. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to uh, put them in the comment section. Um, if you follow me on Facebook, uh, you can also follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram if you want to as well. I think the most informed, uh, the most information I give is on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn.